Hello, and welcome to our discussion panel on anti-pagan discrimination, the untold story. Today we will be joined by a discussion panel of expert speakers, all from different pagan faith traditions. However, before they can join us, I would like to present the preliminary results of our pagan discrimination survey. But before we get to that point, I thought I'd give a little bit of background on who I am and why I am here. I am the Reverend Stephen Haggerty, and I am the presiding officer of the Scottish Pagan Federation. I am also the district manager of the Scottish Pagan Federation and the curator and coordinator of the annual Scottish Pagan Conference. I am the founder of the Council of Near Eastern Pagan Religions and I sit on the Pagan Heathen Symposium. I was the first pagan ever to be elected chair of an interfaith organisation in my home country. And I was the first pagan to ever give a welcome address at the National Interfaith Week launch event in Scotland. I speak uh, as a pagan at events across Scotland as well as to colleges, universities, city and community councils and museums representing Scottish paganism in general. And last year I taught a class on contemporary paganism in modern Scotland at Glasgow University's summer school on religion and spirituality in Scotland. And I am currently working with the curator of St Mungo's Museum of Religious Life on a pagan faith display. The survey results. What did the survey tell us? Well, it told us over 40% of respondents, members of the pagan faith community, stated that they had been directly discriminated against because they are pagans. It also showed that over 60% of respondents, members of the pagan faith community, had said that their friends had suffered direct discrimination because of their faith. Over 40% of respondents felt anxious or depressed because of people's attitudes towards their faith. And over 50% of respondents said they had been made to feel ashamed through people's comments on their faith. It also showed that over 40% of respondents feared their children would be bullied or harassed at the child school knew their family were pagans. It also showed that 40% would be less likely to report incidents of discrimination in the workplace because they are pagans and because they feel they would not be taken seriously. It also showed that over 60% of respondents um, had had other faith communities try to convert them and over 70% of respondents have been told that they worship the devil by other faith communities. It also showed that over 60% of respondents were told they will go to hell because of their faith, while over 90% of respondents feel that paganism is treated less seriously than any other faith tradition. And finally, over 90% of respondents believe that paganism should be taught in non-denominational schools to help reduce this discrimination. So what are we doing about all this? Well, I can confirm we have formally written to the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, asking her for our urgent action in tackling these matters. We've also written to the Scottish Minister for Justice, Hamza Yousaf, the Secretary for Education and Skills, John Swinney, MSP, the Minister for Community Safety, Ash Denham, MSP, the Minister for Further Year Education, Richard Lockhead, as well as John Mason, MSP, who leads the Freedom of Religion and Belief cross-party group. We've also written to the Head of Police Scotland, asking for his urgent action in this matter too. On top of that, we have written to the Director of Interfaith Scotland, as well as Directors of Interfaith Glasgow and Interfaith Edinburgh, all asking for their help in tackling these issues. We have had their initial responses, and we can confirm that they are opening an inquiry into these issues, and we aim to work with them hand in hand towards solutions and strengthening pagan rights here in Scotland. For too long, pagans have been an invisible faith community in Scotland. Too many of us have no choice but to simply live with the prejudice we face on a regular basis. As if it is something to keep silent about and tolerate as part of everyday life, the cost of practicing our faith. This position is not acceptable, nor should it be. Discrimination and prejudice should never be tolerated. We have a long journey ahead of us, but we take these first steps on the path together. We thank you for your strength and support and for the pagan community, for their membership, for without that, these advances would not be possible. Thank you for listening. We will now move across to our discussion panels to discuss these matters in a greater detail and how they affect paganism, not just in Scotland, but across the wider world.
I would now like to introduce you to our panel of speakers, uh, beginning with Morgana Seethover. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate in the panel, Steph. It's uh, wonderful to be with you all uh, and talking about something which is very dear to all of our hearts, especially when we're dealing with uh, many pagans and from different paths. Um, um, I'm in the Netherlands and have been here since the 1970s, although I'm British. So I've seen a little bit of both from uh, what it's like what it's like in the UK and also what it's like here in the Netherlands. Um, PFI was um, started in 1997. So I've had quite a, a bit of experience now. Uh, so I'm hoping to be able to add something valuable to this discussion. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Sarah Kerr. Hi there, um, yep, Sarah Kerr, I'm President of the Pagan Federation in England and Wales. Um, we've recently um, uh, helped Steffi participating in the um, discrimination survey that we're going to talk about today. And we work um, alongside pagans here in England and Wales, helping them to combat the discrimination that they face in their daily lives. So I hope I have something useful to contribute today too. Thank you. And I would now like to introduce Linda Hagerston. Hello. Yes, um, I am the National Interfaith Officer for the Scottish Pagan Federation um, and also an interfaith officer for Glasgow. I am, well, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not Scottish, um, but I'm familiar with um, problems within um, Scotland, uh, England, uh, Wales, as well as Canada and the U.S., and Japan, and I work with asylum seekers and refugees who have also shared their stories about um, uh, difficulties in dealing with certain persecution situations and uh, discriminatory practices in other countries in regards to belief. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I guess the first question we should ask is, what, what does everyone think of of the results of the discrimination survey uh, that, that the Scottish Pagan Federation ran. And it wasn't just focused on Scotland, it was Scotland, England, and it was also Europe. Uh, and the figures were quite staggering as, as the, the, the spectators have just heard. Um, I think um, my first thoughts were, um, I, I was quite shocked that we are still hearing stories and um, statistics like those that showed up on your survey, Steffi. I mean, um, you would like to think that in, in 2021 that that kind of discrimination is is well past us, but it, it showed that it really isn't. I think one of the things you were just talking about, Sarah, um, about the fact that we're still maybe not discriminated against, but we're, we're very seen very much in um, and ridiculed, uh, for our beliefs, uh, as if we're still like the, as if tree hogging is something really uh, bizarre and not to be taken seriously. One of the things I've always noticed, within, certainly within the interfaith circuit, is as soon as you say you're a pagan, the response is, well, you don't belong here because you have no faith. So I always think, uh, how do people actually perceive us? You know, do they actually not understand that uh, um, that we actually do have? religious beliefs which can actually be described as religious beliefs if we're talking about nature religions so my first impression is all, all also one of not so much the discrimination but the way we're actually perceived and how we're often ridiculed as if we're all you know harry potter witches and all the rest of it so not being taken seriously i think is it's also a form of discrimination two things happen when people um discriminate in quotation marks one is that they don't know or they think they don't know any pagans the other one is they've met a kind of pagan because there are many kinds of pagans we need to make that clear there are many paths and many ways to be a pagan there are people who call themselves pagan who we might say aren't so they typically meet folks who are saying, well, you know we don't have scripture and oh I don't worship a deity I you know I like nature and then you, they will also meet people uh, and not realize what they're all about. And they'll go with what they see in the movies. 
or hear in the media. And so they're ignorant of what we really do. And it, it, it's my job to kind of sort them out. Um, you know, usually I hear some, they say something and I laugh and I can't help it because it's hilarious. The things that they pick up. So what I do after I'm finished laughing and sort of embarrassing them, I don't intend to, but I can't help it because it's so bad. Um, I sit down and talk to them and say, look, this is who I am. I'm a pagan. I follow this path. The guy next to me probably doesn't follow the same path, but that doesn't matter because this is what we do. And this is what we generally don't do. And if people are doing it, then we probably don't want them to be called pagans, right? Absolutely right, Linda. I think there's a lot of, um, of people out there who have a lot of misconceptions about what it is to be pagan. Um, and um, they see a lot of um, sensationalism in press and media um, that isn't anywhere near true for most people. Um, and, and they have their, their misconceptions come from a lot of what they've seen and what they what they've what they've heard in press um that's certainly something that i've taken on board this last year is trying to challenge some of those misconceptions in the press um because they're always looking to sensationalize a headline when there's a pagan involved in some sort of situation um there was a particular one where um someone uh, who clearly had mental health problems had um uh, murdered his girlfriend and the first thing on the headline said pagan rituals um, and it was it, trying to explain to them that, that that his crime had nothing to do with anything that that you or I or any other pagan believes but rather it was a mental health issue which was covered later in the article and um, you know it, it was um, it was really difficult to try and explain to the editors that we'd, we'd appreciate it if they didn't put pagan first you know maybe talk about his pagan beliefs later but please stress that it's a mental health issue because that's evidently what it was um so yeah it's, it's trying to challenge those misconceptions um particularly um when they come from places like the press i think um because they're particularly strong imagery one of the things i think is still really important is to make sure that what information is available is correct and if we do see so i think the anti-defamation work certainly hasn't stopped um, and as time has gone on, of course, there have, there have been nuances because when I think about how I saw Pagan Federation in the 1980s and how it's evolved, and also how paganism has evolved, but also how many social issues have changed, especially this whole anti-racism, anti uh, Black Lives Matter, many of these movements have also found their resonation within the pagan community. So I'd, I'd just like to bring forward, again, it's not something that is new, but how we deal with it is changing. That is something that I have noticed because sometimes there may be people within our own community who we don't actually feel comfortable with. So we're not just talking about discrimination from outside the community. There's also, we have to deal with certain issues that we're, we're within our own community. And I think that has really changed as paganism has become more widespread and people are beginning to um, recall the old gods, as I always say, the, the, you know, coming back to the old gods, then I think there are certain issues which have also started raising their um, raising their heads. So I, I think we should not just remember that it's perhaps discrimination or criticism from outside, but we've also got our own communities. It's it's a it's a never growing problem, to be honest. I mean, there is um that I think within any faith community there is um you know a little bit of, of challenging between uh, past traditions, uh, beliefs, whatever you want to call it. Um but I think um, I'm particularly seeing it just lately. I'm doing some work currently um, with um, right wing extremists within paganism. Um, and there's a little bit of me and I think there's a little bit of everyone that wants to go. That doesn't exist in my community. I, you know, I, all the people I know are good and, and that would never happen. But actually, we really have to acknowledge that that kind of thing happens within our community. Um, and that discrimination within our community exists as well. And I think 
Um, I think it's a hard conversation to have, but it's one that we've got to have. And it's one that we've got to keep our eyes open to. Um, and I think, as, as Linda pointed out earlier, you know, conversation is, is key to these things. You've got to talk to people. You've got to have conversations, however uncomfortable they might be. You've got to be open and willing to engage in that conversation. Um, and that's certainly something that um, that I've, I've been trying to work hard on um, these last few months myself. Um, you know, we've all got prejudices that we don't even realise that we've got until these issues come up. Um, and it's um, it's something we've got to deal with in, within ourselves as much as within our community, as much as within the wider community. So I think, um, I think the, the way that the world is changing, the way that these issues like Black Lives Matter and LGBTQIA plus issues and, and things like that, the way they're being brought forward is kind of raising the mirror to all of us and going, look, we've got to, we've got to have these conversations now. We have got to, we've got to get better. We've got to do better. Absolutely. One of the key words is intersectionality mm. uh, for this. Um, yes. You know, whether it is race, gender, sexuality, or our religious belief, our national origin, all these things intersect in some way. Um, you know, as I said, I haven't experienced um, anti-pagan discrimination, but I have experienced discrimination based on my nationality or my perceived nationality. And it's any way you slice it, it is hurtful. And this is one thing that we need to do is to look at things in an intersectional way. This is what's happening now. We are recognizing it um, in part due to movements like Black Lives Matter and so on. Um, but um, there is one of the things that you, you were talking about within our own communities. And one of the good things about having interfaith organizations, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but interfaith organizations often um, offer uh, anti-bias training, um, mm -hmm. anti-discrimination training, uh, training on, you know, where, where our privilege lies and, and, and intersectionality. And I, Personally, I find it really helpful, and I would recommend this to, uh, you know, in particular, anyone who is a pagan leader, because it helps us within our own groups, as well as further uh, taking it further. And there are so many interfaith folks that I want to take to this training as well. So this is something I'm pushing. I would say it's also important that, that we recognize there is a lot of discrimination, not real discrimination out there uh, yes. on, that, on that matter. Uh, certainly, I, I've dealt with quite a lot of discrimination even in the last year. Uh, myself, um, we actually, uh, myself and my wife had to leave our home uh, in the last year because of discrimination we had from our neighbours. Um, it was very, very, uh, I say the word horrendous, I would say, uh, to the point where uh, whenever my wife went outside, they were shouting witch and they were telling all the neighbours, oh, she's a witch, don't speak to her don't help her out, um, and they were like banging the windows in the middle of the night. Um, they, let the, they actually were wiping excrement in the front door. It was pouring our rubbish all over the, the back door, um, threatening our kids, threatening me, to the point where we had to, to basically leave our home. And it was very, very difficult. You know, this, um, and it's, it's shocking, you know, that religion certainly um, extreme religion can cause that level of, of hatred. They were actually stalking uh, my wife through Facebook and found out that, um, you know, she was into um, shamanism and they were making, like, um, I would say Native American noises outside the window and smashing the windows and and it was banging the windows in the middle of the morning and scaring the kids. It was, it was horrendous. Um, and it, it's shocking that yes. this sort of thing goes on. Uh, today, you know, it's and even um, in the last week with with her work with the Scottish Goddess uh, Temple, uh, the Scottish Goddess Temple, uh, we were uh, applying through a uh, social enterprise to to actually find out what we can do to to get more more um, rights for the temple. And the people actually on the phone have been blanking us for some time. And today, they told my wife. Well, can you not use a different word from pagan? You know, do you have to use pagan? I find the word pagan very offensive, actually. Uh, and uh, no one's going to take you seriously in social enterprise. Uh, and that's 
really difficult to to deal with, you know, when you're trying to actually work towards create a, creating a, a community centre uh, here in Scotland for paganism and creating a, a place for pagans to come and have more rights, especially off the back of the discrimination survey. One of the reasons we've started the, the, the actual plans for the temple is because we want to create a, a physical place where other religions and faith communities can come and see what pagans do. It's a, it's a great idea, and it's a great project, and to face that through social enterprise is pretty disheartening, you know, pretty disheartening. It is. It is. I mean, we've um, we've dealt with all kinds of advocacy cases over the last year. Um, I think the most horrendous of them um, was a lady having her children taken away by social services just because her husband told them about her pagan beliefs. Um, and they, the children did get returned. There was no other reason for her having her children removed. It is to engage conversation with CAFCAS, the um, Children and Families Court Service. Um, and we now have um, contact with them um, so that uh, basically if they come across any more cases where pagans are involved and it seems like discrimination is happening, um, that they know they can come to us for help and advice. Um, so they all have our advocacy officers' contact details now, all the CAFCAS officers in the UK. Um, and she got her children back. So, um, so you know, it was it was good news in the end. Um, but um, but yeah, it started a dialogue. It was it was great stuff. Okay, that's good. I just wondered if, if there was any re-education of the, the social worker involved or the social workers involved. Um, um, I'm not entirely sure on that one at the moment, um, uh, but it's certainly something that I've been discussing with my advocacy officer um, that came off the back of that was that we need to be providing um, good quality information for people like social workers um, and things like health visitors and, and, and those kinds of people where they're in situations where they're in people's homes. Um, and they're far more likely to come across things like symbols of their faith um, and their practices than you would if you were meeting them out in the community. Yeah. So um, so it certainly spot, spot um, some work between us about how we do that. Um, we're, we're still working on that at the moment, but it has, um, it, has, it has given us pause for thought and we have started working on information for those kinds of people. So. Um, I've lost a couple of jobs because um, because they found out my my faith and, um, and there's been quite a few other things. My mum herself, um, she's been pagan all her life too, um, and in the seventies she was forced out of her home, um, just like you were. You know, the neighbours found out, and um, she had a brick put through her window, threatening with a message on it, threatening her life, and you know, so um, so yeah, it's. The fact that that's still happening forty years later. Yeah. Um, well, that was the yeah. hardest part. They were they were threatening to smash all our windows in, and we've got a newborn in the house. Yeah. And to, to threaten to, to basically smash the windows in when you've got a baby in the house is 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 ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Oh, my heart breaks for you, Steffi. Um, <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> um, I mean, the kind of that kind of discrimination thankfully is relatively rare or I would hope it is um but it does still happen and I can't I, I, I struggle for words when I hear of cases like this because it just mm. I just want to go and make it stop for the person mm. you know it's it's not well the, the, the police not. told us that the, the hate crime just now is at an all-time high purely because of of the pandemic and lockdown and the covid um, to the point where they found a, a massive jump in hate crimes because people are bored, people are looking for someone to blame, people are looking for a scapegoat, and generally it's it's religious minorities that, that seem to be getting it just now. And I think we were just at the wrong place at the wrong time and with some very backwards, um, very fundamental Catholic neighbours who didn't agree with that sort of thing. Yeah, it's um, any faith that can, <laughs> that can lead people to that kind of thinking kind of um, makes me go, oh. <laughs> um, I mean, that is extremism, isn't it? Yes. When when they can um, when they can target their hate, their their own fears yeah. towards somebody in that manner, it it, it 
well, yeah, it says a lot about it. Yeah, I mean, that's it's horrendous, really. As you said, it's horrible for you, Steffi, for your whole family. You've mentioned two things happening there at the same time. Uh, one is um, the, the problem within the system. Someone that you're going to for funding or support is telling you, this isn't good, we don't want to hear the word pagan. Ooh, bad, bad, bad move. Um, yeah, that person needs to be brought up. Uh, whatever taken care of because of that um, you know, go through that anti-bias training if nothing else um, um, and then yes you're mentioning the 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 faith-based um, aggression and discrimination in Scotland we have um, sectarianism which doesn't help either because if you find yourself in a situation where you can't blame, the Protestant or the Catholic, you're going to blame the next best thing. There is a lot of scapegoating on right, uh, scapegoating going on right now, uh, and yes, and I know it's happening because I, I I live in the same county as Steffi, and I know that it's happening. I've had Irish uh, Catholic friends leave here um, because of this, and and here we have a Catholic family attacking um Steffi's family and it, so it's like it, it it's just this ongoing faith-based problem but it sounds th this this um problem within the system also really bothers me at least it's being recognized as a hate crime what happened to you but this discrimination that you're getting from the social enterprise or Scottish enterprise or whatever it is that's also um you know, something that needs to be worked on. Yeah. When you look at um, the rise of paganism, for instance, you, you look at the the figures that we've got. I mean, we've got more pagans in Scotland than than the Jewish community. You know, we've got we've had more pagan weddings in Scotland than Jewish and Mormon weddings. Uh, you've you've got a lot of pagan festivals going on that are recognised as secular festivals. You've got the Edinburgh Fire Society, uh, the Beltane Fire Festival. You've got uh, up Pelly Ha. Uh, you've got the Largs Viking Festival. You've got a, a myriad of wonderful pagan um, outpourings of, of of fixed festivities where people travel from all over, not just Scotland, but from all over the world to attend uh, these gigantic festivals. I mean, I think the Edinburgh one had, I think it was about 7,000 people or something. It was something ridiculous they had in the last one before lockdown happened, you know, people travelling from all over the world, people booking up every hotel across Edinburgh just to see the, the, the Beltane Fire Festival and to be part of that. And yet at the same time, you've still got all this discrimination going on that, that's, that's thrown up in the discrimination survey. Uh, and I couldn't quite fathom it until it happened to me. I must admit, when I started this, the, the Pagan Discrimination Survey, I started working on it purely because I run the Scottish Pagan Conference, and during the conference, we had decided to have like um, breakout sessions. We would we would ask the community, look, give us feedback, or uh, let's talk about a, an issue. And one of the things that seemed to keep coming up was discrimination that that some of the community was facing, and I couldn't get my head around this. Um, and every conference, it seemed to be coming up more and more, which led me to think, well, I need to do a survey to figure out how many people this is actually affecting in Scotland. And that's when I put together the Pagan Discrimination Survey. But I was, I was shocked at the, the figures that it threw up, certainly in the, the percentages uh, of discrimination that people have faced. Yeah, um, it's not shocked me. Yeah, and I didn't expect to, to, to then face it a year later myself. But it's yeah. certainly educational. It certainly makes, makes what we do that much more important, you know? Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've already talked about some of the um, the possible routes into solving it, but, you know, any any other thoughts on how we solve this problem? I mean, the UN have recently uh, passed a, a resolution around uh, witchcraft-based crimes. Um, so this isn't something that is a, a Scottish or a UK problem. This is a worldwide problem. Um, you know, this whole, um, the way people think about uh, pagans and their practices and titles like witch, you know. So how, how do we go 
about what can we do to play a part in ending that, do you think? People are beginning to see the, um, the value of uh, dialogue. But it's also, I think, I think Linda was also saying within the interfaith context, uh, we need to have a look at how we're actually communicating with each other. Because mm -hmm. if we take on this missionary sort of attitude that, uh, you know, um, that Christianity is the best thing, whatever, then you're still not going to really um, approach people in, um, in what I would call a respectful way. The one thing I've noticed as well is um, I've, I've had problems with the P word and, oh, you know, I wish you would stop using the P word. You know, I was even asked to change the name of Pagan Federation International. And I said, well, that would be quite difficult. You know, what we're going to call it, the Celtic Wicker, whatever. You know, yeah. This is quite hilarious, really. Have a look at what we're actually talking about. Reverence for the earth. Stewards of the earth. You know, we... we how can anybody be against us or find that a pagan way of life is is objectionable? But anyway, any, have you got anything? Uh, Linda, what's your experience? I mean, how can we educate people? What, what, what would you give us a, a bit of advice? I love what you said, Morgana. I'm just sitting here smiling because so much of what you said is right on. Um, okay, yeah, um, we need to go in to the settings where there are different faiths and confront what's happening, but do it in a way that isn't also on the attack because what happens is peer, people are fearful. They are scared of us. And I'm saying us, pagans who, you know, where, whatever they are, whatever their path is. Um, in general, people tend to be scared. One, because they've seen films and things in the media, the guy who was wearing the um, bison thing when he, you know, they stormed the Capitol in the U.S. I mean, honestly, when you get that sort of stuff, what are you going to do? You are going to be fearful. Um, so, you know, we've got to confront that situation and say, well, right. Yes, there are people doing that, but... We are. We don't like it, and we're not going to let that happen if we can help it at all. Um, it's not acceptable to us. Um, it, so that's one thing. You know, people are fearful. We need to go in and be respectful, but not doormats either. And that's one thing people are finding that I'm not. Um, and and I I do have arguments. Arguments are fine. Disagreements are fine. As long as you can support what you're saying, you're honest, uh, and I hate using the word authentic, you know, you're real and, and you're human. You present a human side to all of this. I mean, I know so many folks through interfaith, etc., who would just be appalled at Steffi's story. And I have actually presented not the whole story, Steffi, but told them they weren't aware of what happened to him. And when I told them, it was like, you are joking. And immediately there was a recognition because some of them have also been, you know, persecuted. So there's that finding that commonality. Sadly, it's persecution in this case, but, you know, finding these common points, what makes us connect? What makes us all human? And then to respect the differences. Uh, with intersectionality, Black Lives Matter, with, um, you know, uh, discrimination against women, uh, continuing discrimination against women, um, transgender rights, etc. This whole ball now is the time to make our voices heard, because they are being heard, believe me. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm actually very proud of this happening, but we can't let it go. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> No, I agree with you, Linda. I absolutely agree with you. I think now is the time. The world is changing hugely. Um, you know, people are um, fighting for their right to be who they are um, and, um, and to live their lives as 
they feel are right for them and I think now is the time and I do think as well when I look at people that are younger than me particularly um my adult children they're sort of age 19 and 24 and um, I really see a future where that is happening because they are making it happen and they give me so much hope they really do um and I I take them as a bit of an example so I think I think you're absolutely right now is the time we're talking a lot about interfaith so th this is just an interfaith focus but what do we do to the general public to change perceptions of paganism that's the question I want to ask that is a good question isn't it very good question <laughs> well I I mean I I a member of different communities where being visible makes a heck of a lot of difference. And so I'm out, I'm open as LGBTQ+, I'm out and open as uh, somebody who is gender fluid, I'm out and open as somebody who is transatlantic, how can I not be <laughs> with this accent? Um, I'm out and open as a pagan as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm visible. And I think that's something we can do. One of the things that I often hear people say, it, not just interfaith circles, what do pagans do? Do you do anything for the community? I never see you doing anything. Whereas you can see the longer for Sikhs, you can see, um, you know, Muslims doing food distributions, Christians raising money, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on. Pagans kind of do things individually, quietly. People want yeah. to know what we are doing, not just amongst ourselves and for our families, but for the community and the world. This is this is important. And don't you know? You yeah, don't, you we can't trivialize it. Trivialize no. it. it. It is vital. You are absolutely right. I am. Um, before I came to uh, volunteer for the Pagan Federation, I was. A school governor at my boys school and then I was a scout treasurer for a, for the local troop um, and um, and I was out and proud about being pagan at both these places um, and yes they might have been a little bit shocked at first um, but eventually because they knew me first because they knew they saw my work ethic they saw what I was capable of they knew my skill set um, before they knew that I was pagan um, that once they did know that I was pagan, it made it easier for them to accept. Um, but I've always been involved in one way or another, not just in, in the pagan community that is, is my home, but also in my local community that is also my home. Um, you know, I go litter picking, I, I do various things around around the village. I, 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 um, I give hand massages at the, um, at the local carers support group. You know, I do, I do lots and lots of lovely things for the community. Um, but I don't tend to shout about it a lot. And I think that's, that's you know, a lot of, of pagans, and certainly pagans that I know, do this, a similar sort of thing. You know, they, um, a, a friend of mine volunteers at the soup kitchen in the next village over, for example, but she won't talk about it particularly. <laughs> she just goes and does it. Um, and I think, um, and I think that's quite true of a lot of, of pagans that I know, um, is that they go and do it quietly. There isn't this big, you know, and I think part of that is because we don't have, um, we don't have physical buildings as bases. We don't have, you know, um, and when we do gathering groups, they tend to be small um, rather than larger. Um, so I, I think that's part and parcel of, of the reason why we don't do bigger things. Um, but I think the smaller things like that are just, if not more so, important. I know the yeah. Glasgow Glasgow here does a a, a food drive um, at Yule for the homeless and for uh, people who are, are hard up. Um, mm -hmm. What touching on what you just said there, one of the things I think Ronald Hutton had said was that paganism is roughly fifty years behind um, the Quakers, for instance and getting respect and recognition and he believes the reason for that is there isn't a what, what he would say is a, a pagan um, celebrity or a pagan a recognized pagan out there someone the public all know you know someone to see uh, 
on TV or in the press or in the magazines who gives a, a good role model for what it's like to be a pagan. So mm. when people hear pagan, they just think all sorts because they don't really have that um, that mascot to say, okay, that, this is what a pagan's like, you know. So they just yeah. they just refer to um, either eighties horror movies or, or or Buffy the Vampire Slayer or something like yeah. that. Sabrina the Teenage Witch or Sabrina something. Teenage Witch or something like that. Yeah. I think that's I think you you know that that's totally right on. Now druids have Ronald Hutton, yes. right? And we do have recognition, not just because he's their celebrity druid, but because royal family members are associated with druidry, etc. Right. For other folks who are in paganism, who is there? that stands out. And I know that, you know, there are the teachers, uh, if you're a gardenerian, if you're, um, well, I'm, I'm not a Wiccan, so I, <laughs> I don't know all the terminology or the names, uh, 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 you know. So these people are long gone in many cases. And sometimes the history is a bit questionable when you present it to the general public. Who do we have? that can stand up or just be there as a person that others will understand and respect. I know that there was a there was a project I think you were involved in, Sarah, where they were uh, putting out posters saying, um, hi, I'm blah, 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 I'm a teacher yes. and I'm a pagan. Hi, I'm... Uh, can you tell us a yeah, bit more no, about I'm that? Pagan and we did a we did a hashtag and we did little posters. So there was like, oh, hi, I'm Pagan and I'm a nurse. Um, mine was I'm Pagan and I'm a special needs mum. And you know, just showing people that pagans were everyday folks. Um, you know, I'm Pagan and I'm an occupational therapist. I'm Pagan and I work for Tesco. You know, I just all those all those really ordinary everyday things um, that you know that. Are, part of people's lives as well um that was a great campaign we actually need to run it again <laughs> that, something like that something like that but maybe enough maybe if we can connect to maybe more of a worldwide audience you know mm. and, and maybe even have it in different languages to, to show yeah. you know that you know that's one of the things about the discrimination survey um i, I was approached i think it was from pf germany and there's another pf who approached me asking if they could take the survey questions and translate them into their own language and run the survey themselves because they feel it was needed as well. I do think I need to start possibly connecting to people and putting the survey out in a, in a wider um, way to a wider audience and giving us a, a more accurate picture of of what the discrimination is like against us, possibly in Europe to begin with, and then maybe the Americas. And we can do so much. We can do so much. But it's it's I don't think I don't want I don't want to be celebrity. I can work so much better when I'm low profile. I get to speak to the indigenous people and we don't need the celebrities. We don't. We really don't. What we do need is action. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. We don't need celebrities, but we do need visibility and we do need people who will speak up and carry on the fight and trying to connect the community. I mean, the community, as you say, is everything. And we need to do more to try to connect that. Now is our time. And that we want to make, make the world a better place for not just our communities, but for everyone. If you if you meet a pagan um, and you don't really know what a pagan is, talk to us. We're not that different from you. We're really not. I think this is perhaps the most important message that none of us are alone. Thank you. Thank you for all listening, by the way. It's been a wonderful conversation. Let's stick together and let's answer the call when, when it's needed. I think that's the only thing we can do. Thank you. I thank you for everybody for listening. Yeah, I think um I think I agree there. I mean, I mean, first of all, you know, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be at an event like this and be able to speak about issues like this because they're incredibly important and especially right now in this world that we're in. I've got a lot from this conversation, so I'm really, um, I'm really grateful for what we've been doing today. Yes, and I've got a, a lot out of this conversation as well, more than I thought I would, to be honest. Um, I came into it with trepidation, but um, I'm leaving with 
um, a lighter heart. Thank you, everyone, very, very much. Massive thank you to Morgana, to Sarah, to Linda um, for actually making this a really great event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.